Man Up, brought to you by Construction Professionals, a program dedicated to inspiring and helping men live lives of heroic virtue. Join Joe Stopulus every Monday at 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. on Iowa Catholic Radio. And now, it's time to Man Up. Welcome to Man Up on Iowa Catholic Radio. We are broadcasting from the Mercy One studio, heard on 1150 AM, 88.5 FM, and 94.5 FM around the globe, streaming online at iowacatholicradio.com. Also, please like our show on Facebook, subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, follow us on Twitter, all of that great stuff. I am Joe Stopulus, and today I am joined again by Katie Patrizio for the third time in our Great Men of the Bible series, this time to cover the prophet Daniel. Let's start in prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. St. Michael, the archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and the snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. As I mentioned, Katie Patrizio will be joining us for her third time on uh, the show to discuss Daniel, the prophet Daniel. Uh... From a timeline perspective, uh, last week we covered Ezekiel. It's roughly the same time period. We're in exile, uh, 605 B.C. to 535 B.C., and and Ezekiel was about a 20-year period there between 590 B.C. and 571, covering a lot of the same same time period but much different writings, Uh, and we'll explore that on the other side of the break with Katie. Wanted to just real quick touch on yesterday's second reading uh, from the second letter of Paul to Colossians. Brothers and sisters, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ. On behalf of his body, which is the church, of which I am a minister, in accordance with God's stewardship given to me, to bring to completion for you and the word of God, the mystery hidden from ages and from generations past. I, I think so often it's, it's important for us to think of that redemptive suffering. Uh, and, and Paul talks about it here. I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. He's filling up what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ. And, you know, what is lacking in Christ's afflictions on the cross? Well, nothing outside of our participation in it. And I mentioned this a few weeks ago, but how often we we can get to that the, the idea of woe is me, you know, when we have sufferings come our way. But we just need to turn to, there's so much literature in the, in the New Testament, in the Old Testament as well, in the Psalms of, of times of, of disappointment uh, and finding that perseverance in, in our troubles. And I think, as, especially as we've gone through the prophets these last two weeks and then again this week, they have so much hardship, uh, so much despair in their lives. But throughout it all, they maintain a level of confidence and even rejoicing in the sufferings they have. And... I mean, in 2019, how blessed we are. Uh, we're not dying of diseases. Uh, we, we don't have lots of uh, famines and things like that today, especially in the United States. The sufferings that we're inflicting are, are so minor, especially compared to them, uh, that we really just we, we need to be thankful and rejoice uh, in what we've been given and when we find tough times uh, to turn to the Lord. And I, I just think that reading from, from the second, uh, second reading from Paul yesterday was was right on target for what this show, a lot of the themes that have been coming out uh, of these great men of the Bible. Well, we're going to head to a short break. Uh, We're going to have Katie Patrizio on on the other side as we explore the prophet Daniel. Thank you, construction professionals, for underwriting Man Up. Construction professionals have been long supporters of Iowa Catholic Radio, and we've seen their work firsthand. It's very impressive. They do remodeling or new construction that is innovative, functional, and designing what you want. cpcustomhomes.com. Support for programming of Catholic Women Now partially provided by Farm Bureau agent Cindy Schulte. Cindy Schulte on the web at cindyschulte.com, 515-226-2111. Cindy and her team know health insurance. Thank you, Confluence Brewing Company, for underwriting Christ is the Answer with Father Ricardo and for your support of Iowa Catholic Radio. Father Ricardo is featured daily at 11 a.m. Monday through Friday. Confluence Brewing Company is located off the bike trail south of Grays Lake, confluencebrewing.com. The Catholic Tuition Organization provides tuition assistance to qualified families so they can send their kids to our Catholic schools. Great tax benefits for donors and great education for our kids. Online, ctoiowa.org.
Welcome back to Man Up on Iowa Catholic Radio. I am Joe Stopulus, and today I am joined again by Katie Patrizio. Katie, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me, Joe. You have no need for an introduction anymore. Director of Faith Formation at St. Cecilia's Parish in Ames, but you've been on the show now. You've got a lot of, you know, a lot of fancy degrees and whatnot. You've been on the show enough that our audience knows who you are, I think. All right. I but can I, put that on my list. The issue is, Katie, I think um, normally you're in studio. This is the first time we've done the call-in with you. And right. So I think that this is an important time for us to explain to our listeners it took a long time to get you on the phone today. I believe <laughs> that the devil does not want this conversation to take place. It took us about 15 minutes to get connected. So let's just tell everyone right now, go to confession. Okay, go to confession. <laughs> We've got to use this as an opportunity to defeat the evil one. Uh, do something good with this because this interview was not supposed to happen. Uh, just do well, how much technical yeah. difficulties we had. <laughs> That's funny. I do think the book of Daniel might be my favorite Old Testament book, so maybe there's something there. There it is. Well, let's dive in, and there's a lot to cover. I, we talked ahead of the show. There's a tremendous amount to cover in a small amount of time. You know, I'd say with a handful of these uh, great men, we've done two shows. Daniel would be one of those guys, uh, but we're going to try fitting it in in one interview. Uh, the way we've been doing it, especially with these prophets recently, Katie, can you kind of just walk us through maybe the historical context of where this book fits in in the greater scheme of salvation history? And then we'll kind of dive into, you know, who is Daniel as a man and what can we learn from him? Yeah, so um, all the prophets span a time leading up to, during, and after the exile uh, into Babylon. And so the exile into Babylon affected the southern tribes of Israel before the southern tribes went into exile in Babylon. The northern tribes were actually taken into exile by Assyria, and they never returned to the promised land. So in the book of Daniel, we're dealing with the people of uh, Judah, of the southern tribes, in exile in Babylon, serving the Babylonian kings, um, and just waiting and hoping for the restoration of um Jerusalem and the temple and temple worship and uh, their return to the promised land. So that's uh, the 22nd uh, placement of where we are in the book of the Bible. So it says in the, this is Daniel 1, right at the beginning, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Uh, so Jehoiakim is good or bad? Uh, <laughs> that's a great question. Uh, probably, I you know, I can't say, um, but probably not so great because there weren't a ton of really awesome kings after David and Solomon. So just to guess here, I'm not super familiar with a, his particular yeah, reign. I think, but I, think he's, I think he's in the bad he's side. He's not Josiah. Yeah. He's not Hezekiah. Yep. So I'm thinking probably not so great. And then Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, comes and besieges it. Now, Nebuchadnezzar, what's your take on him? Uh, in this book, one thing you're going to learn pretty quickly is there's like good Nebuchadnezzar and there's bad. Like he's kind of, he's good and then he's really bad and then he's good and he's really bad. Uh, what are we supposed to take from him? Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, for one, um, it's interesting to see kind of the parallels in the story between Daniel in Babylon and Joseph in Egypt. Mm -hmm. And it's possible that Nebuchadnezzar has a little bit of that too. He's kind of like the Pharaoh. Yep. He's got this back and forth going on. So, I mean, first of all, he besieges Jerusalem, and he takes the Jewish people off into exile. So that's not great. And he doesn't do that in the kindest way either. I mean, we read that he um, completely sacks the temple and takes the, the sacred vessels off into exile with him and, uh, and decides, you know, I'm going to have this nice, you know, chalice that used to be in the temple as my, you know, uh, mug for my morning cup of coffee, and that's extremely sacrilegious for the people. Um, but at the same time, if you know, if you're familiar in Daniel three with the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, popularized by Veggie Tales, um, you of know, of course, that everyone knew after, that. Yeah. <laughs> after Nebuchadnezzar has the experience of throwing the three young men into the fire and seeing that they are not consumed, he has this great conversion experience and declares that, uh, you know, the God of Israel is the true God and what have you, but, um, you know, there's this back and forth with him, just like both the Pharaoh and Egypt. So the, the the book of Daniel, to me, first off, there's there's the beginning part, which is really when he's Daniel in the time during the Babylonian uh, Empire, and there's the second part of it, which is the, the apocalyptic visions that are uh, ascribed to Daniel uh, in the foretelling of the, of the of the future. Well, first off, the book of Daniel itself is not written 
by Daniel. It's just the stories of Daniel and his and his and his writings and the story of his life. So there's a there's really a few ways we could go with this. We could talk about the stories of Daniel and the uh, the apocalyptic writings. Um, Saint Jerome. Uh, you'd mentioned to me that said that the book of Daniel more than any other book speaks of the Messiah. And I think let's, let's hit on some of those themes and then let's dive into the life of Daniel. So talk about why, why does St. Jerome think this book was so important? Yeah, well, first of all, I mean, let's situate this. It's a, it's a big claim for Jerome to make because we're, uh, we're talking about Daniel in competition with books like Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah. These are books that we're way more familiar with just from reading the liturgy um, than the book of Daniel. And so it's fascinating. We have to ask ourselves, why does Jerome say that of all the prophecies in the Old Testament, the book of Daniel speaks most clearly of the Messiah? There's a couple things we can point to, but um, one very particular um, section of Daniel that we can point to is in Daniel chapter 9. And in Daniel chapter 9, um, Daniel himself is praying. He, um, he, he observes, it tells us that Daniel 9, verse 2, that he perceived reading himself the prophet Jeremiah, interestingly enough, that um, the days uh, had passed for the end of the desolation of Jerusalem. So he's, he's feeling that the exile should be coming to a close, but he notes that in Jeremiah that there's kind of this conditional sense to the people's return to Israel, and that condition is their repentance. And Daniel observes that the people have not yet repented, from their sinful ways, and so he sees that um, God is not in a way required to return the people to the promised land, and so in um, the following verses, Daniel prays this beautiful prayer where he asks on behalf of the people forgiveness for their sinfulness, and he asks for the restoration of Jerusalem, and as he's praying, if we jump to verse 20, it says, as he was speaking and praying and confessing his sins, the angel Gabriel comes to him in a vision and he prophesies when God will allow the desolation to come to an end and when the people will be returned to the land and when Jerusalem will be restored. And he prophesies a particular time frame, and he says 70 weeks of years. And that's a little confusing for us, but 70 weeks of years, we get to that number by just multiplying 70 by 7. That's what he meant by weeks of years. And 70 times 7 is 490. So we're talking 490 years here. And um, in particular, Gabriel goes on to say that the 490 years will begin um, to, to roll, if you will, after the word to restore Jerusalem. That's the language that the angel Gabriel uses. And scholars have identified the word to restore Jerusalem as Artaxerxes' decree to rebuild the temple, which occurred around uh, 457 B.C. And in the most beautiful way, if you do a little bit of math, uh, 490 years, 70 weeks of years after 457 B.C., you come to 33 A.D., when our Lord died upon the cross. And um, the angel Gabriel uh, speaks specific language about what will happen after the 490 years. He will say, uh, he says that it will be the finish of transgression, the end to sin, the atonement for iniquity, um, the bringing of everlasting righteousness, on and on and on. This language is only ever found in Scripture one other time in Leviticus 26, which is a description of the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. And interestingly enough, on uh, Yom Kippur, every 49 years, there was the announcement of the Jubilee year in which debts were forgiven and property was returned. And scholars see that in the 70 weeks of years, the 490 years, there's 10 cycles of jubilees. So uh, 49 times 10, 7 times 17, 49, the jubilee year, and 10 cycles of them, 490 years. Some scholars call this the great jubilee. And so at that Yom Kippur, um, in the 490th year, um, the, the Jubilee will be announced, the great Jubilee, our Lord will die on the cross and he will um, expiate sin entirely. It will be the, the mega day of atonement, and from that day forward there won't be any more days of atonement, if that makes sense. So in addition to him prophesying the basically the exact time of the new kingdom uh, in, well, as in Daniel 9, one other thing I think is important for us as we're looking at the book of Daniel and, and maybe some quick takeaways, 
uh, so a I think it adds credence to our faith, right? So here's one of the old prophet, uh, Old Testament prophets, who so accurately predicts this, and then also uh, earlier on in the book. Um, the, the kingdoms that are to come. He predicts all those things that are going to happen, all the kingdoms are going to take over, and then eventually Jesus' kingdom is going to reign starting in 33 AD. Furthermore, one of the things, I mentioned confession kind of jokingly, but seriously, it's always important to go, and anytime this show can encourage you to go to confession, you should be going at least once a month. Uh, something to think about. Uh, I would bring this to prayer. If, I could, if there's one thing you can take away from this episode on Daniel, uh, would be go to Daniel 9, Go to Daniel 9, verse 3, or it has to be verse 4 is when he starts actually doing this prayer, and pray along with this. You mentioned this beautiful prayer. I would argue it's one of the most beautiful prayers in all of the Bible. And mm-hmm. it is this, it, it harkens back to Psalm 51 of just a beautiful prayer of, of sorrow and of contrition. Uh, so take this with you uh, to confession. Bring you know, Read this ahead of time, read it afterwards, um, and, and pray it. Pray with this great prayer that Daniel gives us uh, in in Daniel nine, basically the whole book, the whole the whole thing of Daniel nine uh, four through through twenty. Um, so, in addition to the prophecies, there's also some really great stories in here uh, of Daniel and, and his friends. So, you mentioned the, the parallels to Joseph. Daniel uh, is appointed by Nebuchadnezzar. He is he is because of his ability to interpret dreams, uh, and he finds himself in in a position of would you call it a position of power or at least a position of rank, right? Yeah, I would say power, too. At least the language seems to indicate that. And so, again, he does this because of his ability to interpret dreams. But then this, you know, similarly to Joseph, we now have these, you know, (laughs) the king likes Daniel, but at the same time, the king has to, he makes these ridiculous laws against worshiping other gods. And so he finds himself... uh, having to go against you know people he likes like Daniel. So can you walk us through again? You mentioned the um, the important stories of the fiery furnace. Can you give us a little bit of what we can learn uh, from the men in that story? Yeah, I think there's a ton we can learn, obviously on the surface, but if you go a little bit deeper in the context, it's really profound. So one overarching theme that scholars have pointed out in the book of Daniel is a sense of cult worship, this big question that the Jewish people are dealing with in exile, which is how do we worship when we don't have the temple? This is something that's easy for us to overlook. I mean, imagine you're a Jew and you have very rigorous laws for how you worship God, and all of a sudden all the um, all the, the settings for those laws are wiped away and you no longer have the temple or sacrifice or any of these things. So there's this big question, how do we worship as faithful Jews in exile, and what the, Daniel and his friends seem to come through, come to the conclusion they come to, and I think this is intentional, I think they realize what's going on here, they come to the conclusion that when the temple is not present and animal sacrifice is not possible, that the only proper sacrifice is self-sacrifice. And it's important to note here that it's not just a sense that, oh, when animals aren't around and we can't sacrifice animals, we'll put our place in their stead, Rather, it's the other way around. So if we remember back to the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve sin, they clothe themselves in fig leaves. This isn't really adequate for them. And so it tells us that God clothes them with animal skins. And so there's an implication that an animal dies to cover up for their sinfulness. And so animals are always there in our place. And so it's actually more proper that we would personally offer sacrifice, even self-sacrifice, for the sake of our sinfulness, and to offer right worship to God. And we see this coming through in particular language that we hear in Daniel. So, for example, the young men are referred to as free from blemish, which is what was required of the animals, as well as the priests serving in the temple. It alludes to a three-year training that the young men had, which three years was the ideal age of sacrificial animals. And it also talks about how they um, sought uh, to not defile themselves by the the king's rich food. In other words, they're still observing kosher laws so as to make sure that they are um, pure for worship. And so in the story of the fiery furnace, we do have proper worship, which can take place apart from the temple. And in fact, it's this wonderful example of God bringing good out of evil because this great evil of not being able to worship in the temple leads the men, the righteous men of uh, Israel to offer even more proper worship, which is 
self-sacrifice, the willingness to offer their very self to God. And when you look here, this is now in uh, Daniel 3, verse 16, uh, when they, this is the point where they've been ordered into the furnace. And it says, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hands, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your God or worship the golden image which you have set up. Again, one of the first lessons we can take away just so concretely is you don't serve other gods. Uh, That is the first commandment. Uh, There is no other God besides me. And what are we putting as gods in our life? And I think that this is just how much <laughs> how much do we need to have in our lives to where our faith is at this point, right? This is where we all need to be is that if if we're asked to, whether it's by the government or by another person or by a boss, to do stuff that we know is not right, we need to be able to have the courage of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to say, no, no, I will not, I will not bend my knee uh, in any way, shape, or form, and I will go into the fiery furnace. And if God saves me from that, great. If not, I'm still, I would rather go in death to God, then die for and then die for my faith. Uh, and I just see the courage of those three guys. And then further on, uh, we can move to Daniel in the lion's den. Again, that's probably the most famous story. Is as, as I have kids now, I'm, I'm reliving a lot of these stories, so I see which ones are the most famous. Daniel in the lion's den uh, pops up a lot, and it's a similar type of thing that it, you know Nebuchadnezzar says. You know, if you you he is basically tricked. These guys. You can you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but basically uh, they make a law that says you cannot worship anything else, and if you do, you get in trouble. Knowing that Daniel's not going to do it, so they're trying to hatch a plot to kill Daniel, uh, and Daniel rightly stands up for it. Uh, can you fill in the gaps there? Yeah, yeah. Um, no, you got it exactly right. I mean, it's not Nebuchadnezzar at this point; it's Darius. Yeah, Darius, yeah. So the the Medes have taken over. It, it can be hard. There's so much. Uh, power uh, mongering going on. That can be hard to keep track here in Daniel. But everything else that you mentioned is essentially right. And so we have this parallel that occurs with Darius as the story, with the story uh, that we just looked at, uh, the fiery furnace with Nebuchadnezzar. Um, Because, yes, Darius is um, sympathetic to Daniel. He likes Daniel very much. And, in fact, in some ways, I feel like Darius um, is almost a little bit of a Pontius Pilate kind of figure. Mm -hmm. And some drawing connections that I... I mean, they're not very clear connections, but I think of him because um, Pontius Pilate in some ways seemed to let his apathy um, get the best of him. And so Darius isn't um, out to get Daniel so much, but he's very apathetic. And so when people propose these laws to him, he's like, sure, why not? I'll be God for a month, um, which is just kind of ridiculous to consider. But he has to put his foot in his mouth when his own law requires him to um, attempt to put to death one of his favorite people. Um, but Daniel, like you just mentioned with the three young men, is willing to go to his martyrdom for the sake of the Lord and faithfulness to God and prayer and, uh, and, and prayer towards Jerusalem. He has this great longing for Jerusalem. Well, Katie... As I mentioned at the beginning of the show, I knew it was going to go too fast because there's too much information for us to cover in yeah. Daniel. So unfortunately, we have to take a break and and, head, and end this conversation on Daniel. Uh, appreciate you joining us uh, for this this conversation today. And judging by your track record, I think we'll be having you on again. <laughs> I'd love to. Thanks, Joe. Hey, thanks so much. We're going to stick around, uh, head to a short break, and when we return, I'll wrap up the conversation on Daniel. I'm Jean Wells, Executive Director of the Catholic Tuition Organization, with great news for families who want to send their kids to Catholic school. Today, more families than ever will qualify for tuition assistance from CTO. Even a family of four with household income less than $103,000 now qualifies. Have questions? 515-237-5010. What's our bottom line at CTO? It's for the kids and their future. Thank you to Confluence Brewing Company for underwriting Christ is the Answer with Father Ricardo, heard Monday through Friday at 11 a.m. Confluence Brewing Company is a local brewery in Des Moines featuring seasonal and limited release beers. They have cans and growlers to go, apparel, and other gifts for family and friends. Live music is featured in the tap room. Confluence Brewing Company is located off the bike trail south of Grays Lake. Thank you to Confluence Brewing Company for your support of Iowa Catholic Radio on the web at confluencebrewing.com. That's confluencebrewing.com. My help comes from you, you're right here pulling through, you carry my weight. 
Welcome back to Man Up on Iowa Catholic Radio. My thanks again to Katie Patrizio for joining me for this third time in the Great Men of the Bible series. And the book of Daniel, as I mentioned earlier, has just there's a lot of different types of literature in it. There's a lot of different things that we uh, can take out of it, can glean from the book. And there's a few a few things I'd like to touch on real quick. When we think of Daniel and then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, there are three main things that come to me when I see them as an example of how we can live our lives. And really those are integrity, purity, and faith. All four of these guys had integrity and they knew in their heart what was right. They knew right from wrong. They obviously worked on it. And Katie mentioned that they, they, they had worked very diligently to become the men of God that they were called to be. And they kept themselves pure. They were the pure sacrifice that she, she alluded to. Uh, they'd kept themselves pure for God. And they had, they had faith. They had such strong faith. And one of the things is uh, Bishop Barron talks about this. Father John Carter talks about this. I hear it all a, a lot and a lot. Faith is not blind. Faith is not just thinking, uh, just believing. Things. It's putting our trust in something that we ha- that we have reason to trust in, and that is God. We have re- there's ample ample reasons to put our trust and our faith in God. Uh, and I've heard it said that we need to be able to trust in God that if we were falling, we just trust that he would catch us at all times, that we would be leaning on him so heavily that if he wasn't there, we'd fall over. And I think you see that faith, that devout faith from, from Daniel and his friends throughout this book. Another thing, and I, I was actually in our men's group this morning talking about this, in addition to that prayer in Daniel 9 of, of repentance, such strong repentance, how we can use these great texts of the Old Testament, especially in the Psalms and Proverbs, and pray with them. I think we as Catholics lose so much of this great uh, great literature, great prayers from the Bible. We just don't know them that well. But there's another one here. This is in Daniel 3, uh, 28. And this is as the three were taken out of the furnace. And they, the three is with one mouth, praised and glorified and blessed God in the furnace, saying, Blessed are you, O Lord God of our fathers, and praise, hi, praise and highly exalted forever. And blessed is your glorious holy name to be praised, highly praised and highly exalted forever. Blessed are you in the temple of your holy glory to be extolled and highly glorified forever. And it goes on. I mean, it goes on for paragraphs and paragraphs and paragraphs, just blessing, blessing the Lord. And I think we can use these texts throughout the Bible to help bring some more of that glory and praise that God deserves into our own life. So I'd encourage you to do that. I'd encourage you to look at the book of Daniel and learn from Daniel and use some of these prayers in your own prayer life. Thank you again for joining us on Man Up on IO Catholic Radio. I am Joe Stopulis. It is time to man up. Man Up, inspiring men to live out their call to holiness with Joe Stopulis. Heard Mondays at 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. on Iowa Catholic Radio. Brought to you by Construction Professionals.